Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. We think we have a very entertaining program for you tonight. My name is Mark Genovese, and I'm president of the society. I don't have to run for anything right now. I'm already president. I'm good. Me and Bernie, Joe, we're all good. Donald, we're all good. We're all good. Tonight, we're going to have a special speaker. But before we get to, to Pip, uh, I've got a couple of announcements, mainly for the, for the membership. Uh, the, the budget that we're operating on as a board, uh, as a society, the copies of the uh, printout of the actual budget is up on the back table, which you'll see if you go up there. And over on the right-hand side, my right here, there, there are handouts for the school district meeting and the town meeting. The boat coming up next Tuesday. Apparently, the newspaper couldn't find its way to put the supplement in that they usually put in every year. So, if you don't have any information yet, uh, one of the firemen brought those in tonight. So, when you leave tonight, if you want to pick up one, uh, you can do it in preparation for the big day next Tuesday. We'd also like to note that we have some memorabilia back of, of the fire, firemen's days in the past. And we also have a, a donation a bucket, and we have some information about membership. Uh, we're looking for renewals of existing members, and of course, anyone that would like to join. Uh, we have membership applications up there, so feel free to take a peek at that. I think that's all the uh, all the things we have for the for the membership. One of the things we want to do here before we get started is to to recognize the firefighters who chose to come tonight to hear the presentation. Uh, uh, how many of you are firemen that are here tonight from Milford or surrounding towns? How many of you are? Okay, we got a few people. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was just about to say, let's give them a round of applause. For all you do, we appreciate it very much. And now we're going to introduce uh, Pip Adams. He's going to tell us some stories about his days in the fire department and some days and some stories about when his father was in the fire department. And uh, so we're going to go back probably, oh, gee. 70, 80 years here, probably. <laughs> Not that you were around for all of that, Pip. I mean. So without any further discussion from me, we're going to turn this right over to Pip Adams. Please stand. <laughs> it hasn't changed. <laughs> Wow, um, I didn't quite know what to expect, and it certainly is uh, really for me to come back to Milford, having spent pretty much a good part of my life here, uh, I have certainly seen great amount of changes. Now, what has really brought me here tonight uh, is kind of interesting, because the brother Herb calls me and he says, the, the, the society got this coat, and it seems like it has maybe your name on it. Would you be willing to come over and identify it? And um, this gal, Charlie, she's, she's a great gal. She's really talking to you. So Cecile and I came over, and we met, and we talked, and we discussed. And yes, it turns out that it is my coat. <laughs> and if I wait. And at the, t at the time, I had a, uh, a young uh, Boy Scout uh, that was a photographer, and this is an actual picture. It's down in back, and we'll have it. This is an actual picture with that coat on. And I was talking with a firefighter, uh, Tottarelli, tonight, and he, we recognized that it was at a building that was uh, near the railroad tracks off of uh, South Street that we had a fire burn in. And uh, that happened to be one of the moments that. Uh, uh, we, we did take a little bit of a break. Before I go too much further, I would really like to recognize that the town of Milford is extremely fortunate to have such dedicated people 
that are in charge of this historical society. Um, I don't think any of us realize what they do and the accomplishments. I've only had a chance to be in the building over on um, Union Street just for a little bit, and it truly is amazing, and they definitely have to be congratulated and, and support them in any way we can. I'm going to start with just a little bit of a story that will help me and help maybe, maybe you'll get a little chuckle out of it. It appears that there was a widower and a widow. They go to their 70th class reunion. Throughout the evening, an old flame is rekindled between them. At the end of the evening, he, she, he says to her, will you marry me? And she says, yes, yes, I'll marry you. Well, the next morning he wakes up and he's very confused. He can't remember whether she said yes or did she say no. He calls her up the next morning. Did you say yes or did you say no? You'd marry me. She says, I said yes, I would. Oh, she says, I'm so happy you called me. I couldn't remember who asked me. <laughs> so I use that little bit of the last part of that line. I'm not sure I can, I remember who asked me to come tonight. I'm not sure I remember back in 1950s everything that you might want me to talk about. And maybe I shouldn't know about so Or you shouldn't know about so I was born in 1941. Um, my folks are Albert and Hazel Adams. Uh, we originally lived on Elm Street. Many of you may not recognize it or remember the Haywood, the Haywood Farm. Just below that, there was a big red building. We lived in that building. It had a big barn, and when we, both of my brother and I were probably two and three. The barn caught on fire. Uh, thank goodness to volunteer firefighters in the town of Milford. We were rescued up by ladders out over the porch that we were in next to the, the building. Maybe somehow that is where I first got my incentive to want to be a firefighter. And now I'm not sure. We moved from there to uh, the Jones family, which is up near Twin Toes. Probably many of you learned to ski there. That was an area that um, now is just basically a hill. Uh, Richard Jones was in my class. He's the one that went down on the thresher. And we, we lost him on the thresher. Then we moved to Osgood Road, where probably we spent the better part of our days. We've had some great times. And you know, I started to tell some people this when I first came in and think we got talking to people. But this is better than going to a funeral. This is better than going to a wedding. There's nobody dead, and we don't have to worry about celebrating somebody. But yet, we're meeting a lot of people. I met a neighbor who lived across the street. We probably waved to each other many times, and uh, Sandy of uh, uh, Philbrick uh, lived across the street in what we call Slab City. And uh, so then I graduated from high school. <coughs> I uh, got employed. I was going to be employed by the Fondies. Now, let me take you around the town of 1950. Now, some of you may remember some of this, some of you won't. If you stand on the corner down there, we had Bristol's, which was a restaurant. We had, uh, there was a brick building, it was an apartment, and then Hicks Jewelry. A little bit of an alleyway, and then we had the Army and Navy. And we would have an A&P, Five and Dime, Quality Shop, Latches Theater. Now, Latches Theater, current, with the movie playing, Elizabeth Taylor starring a hot, a cat on a hot tin roof. And whether she was too hot for the theater, we don't know. We moved on from there. If you keep going, there was, um, we have, um, I get my memory going here. Dyer's Drug was there, and then we had Tom's Market. Across from that, excuse me? Powers. Powers, yes, thank you. Yep, and then Overs was down, uh, down this way. Then we had the uh, newsstand. Yep. Many of us probably remember, you go there, it was right on the corner. Uh, we had uh, Sal's Barbershop, we came around. We had Philbert's Restaurant. Big White Elephant Shop was down here. And uh, who remembers where the fire station was? Downstairs. Downstairs, yes, it was downstairs. Uh, and the police station was over in the corner. So those are a few of the uh, remembrance. We, the cabinet press was originally um, up near the school, they moved down 
down to the present location where they're at. That's where I worked for about 11 years. Um, had the misfortune of running my hand into a printing press. And um, <clears throat> then I had the opportunity to, to do a paper store. I did a paper store. And at that time, I took some testing for the Manchester Fire Department. And at the age of 42, I was the first and oldest professional firefighter. Now, throughout the evening, I'm going to make some comparison to the professional firefighter and the volunteer firefighter, because there is a great difference. And um, I, will, uh, I will kind of allude upon that at this point. you got to remember, volunteer firefighters, that's what they are. And when the sound goes off, and in this case, it was always a whistle was on top of this building, it would blow 53. And those companies, those men that belonged to a company, would make their way to the fire station. There was a protocol that it had to have a, an officer, a certain amount of men on the vehicle before it could leave the station. And over the years, it was always interesting that None of us ever crashed into each other. Um, none of us seemed to run over anybody. We had our little hoopy lights. You've probably seen some, you know, a little bubble thing we used to put on top. Technically, we were supposed to obey all speed limits, all rules and regulations. We had a great fire chief at the time, I mean, a police chief at the time, Rocky Rockwell. And I think Rocky just knew that when that whistle blew, he better be out of the way, because uh, we were coming in. <clears throat> the station stayed there, and the firefighters every year would go to town meeting, and they would want a new station. I remember very distinctly, <laughs> almost five years, we tried to get a new fire station. A gentleman, and I, I thought I wouldn't mention a lot of names, but I will mention his name because it's in, it was bad at one time, but it was good at another. And that was Mr. Ernie Barrett. Some of you may remember him. But it seemed that every time we came for a proposal, it was like, no, they really don't need that. They, they, they can make do. So every annual meeting, after the town meeting, we would have a meeting downstairs. We'd meet the whole department. We'd vote on the new chief. And I sort of said, you know, fellas, the only way we're going to get a fire station is if we do the work. We have to show the need for a fire station. So somebody says, well, will you be chairman? And I'm foolishly saying, well, I can do that if you give me six people. So we would have a voting of break up a tie so we have a vote on something. So we did that and we sat it in. Uh, trying to learn what, what new apparatus sizes were, what were we encountering, how long would it take us to go from downtown to a rural area. We encountered, we, uh, we were able to get an architect. Uh, he said he would design a building for us, as you see it pretty much today, with the condition that if it went through, he would get to be able to uh, get the contract. So we worked and we went around town. We visited anybody that we could go into. If you were a church group we would, and invited us in, we were there. And we began to run up against a brick wall along the way. Now, I don't know whether any of you remember Louise Gale. She had a, an office across the street over here. And she met with us one morning. And she looked at us and she said, fellas, do not get defensive. She says, stay on the positive line. She said, be offensive. Keep going after your station. And we did. And it came town meeting night. And I remember Kenny Hawes, myself, the committee, we had charts. We had slides. We had more things than we, you could imagine. We knew the size of every new fire engine coming out, all new pieces of apparatus. And we went to town meeting, gave a little bit of a speech, Ernie Barrett stands up, and I'm standing there, okay, I'm ready for you. <laughs> and he raises his hand, he says, folks, the firefighters have shown that they need a new fire station. I say we vote for it. <laughs> and five minutes later, it was voted in. 
And to this day, I've always still remembered all those cases that we lugged in there. We, I mean, we were ready to tell him anything he needed to know. But uh, anyway, we now have a new station, as you know, that we have some great pieces of equipment. The volunteer firefighter goes back many, 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 many years. Um, and in fact, you can go all the way back to the Roman days if you really want to. Uh, remember in the Roman days? How did they basically fight fires? They had a wooden uh, water system that came into the uh, community. Along the way, they had openings and they had a wooden plug in there. When the fire call went out, everybody was supposed to have a bucket. And they would say, throw out your buckets. Now there's terminology in the fire department called take the plug, meaning take the fire hydrant. In the Roman days, they would pull that wooden plug to get the water. And that's where we get this terminology today, take the plug. Now, while I'm on that subject, we had a winter storm one year. Very, we, had, we had many winter storms, and the sidewalks in the, were really covered with pretty heavy snow banks. I remember one evening, we were probably about 2 o'clock in the morning, we get a fire call for down on Nashville Street. I'm on the back of engine one along with somebody else. We have what's called the ring. That's a big metal ring and it's hooked to a hose that's in the fire bed. And when you put that over the hydrant, it pulls the hose out so that you can hook it to the hydrant. The engine gets to the fire and you can supply water. We're going down Nashville Street. Now, I won't tell you the chief's name, but I'm there and he's signaling to us, take this, take this hydrant, take this hydrant. There's a big mound. I'm like, chief, that's not a hydrant. Take this hydrant. So I throw the ring on it. The engine goes about 50 feet to want to get tra trash can down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Young boys around the age of 16 in the town of Milford always look forward to the summertime. Because at that age, they were allowed to respond to brush fires, which is a three signal. Now, it seemed that there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Pease who had a quarry. Now, Mr. Pease, during the summer, people would ask him, well, how do we get to your quarry? Well, just follow the fire engines when the whistle blows. Because Mr. Pease, on occasion, that's what he would do. He would build a little fire or build a fire, have a small brush fire, and 53 would be called, and of course everybody races up to his, his uh, property. <coughs> well, it seems that he was beginning to be pretty annoying and kind of against the law, so they staked him out. And they waited, and it, after a while, they saw him go to a, an area, and he starts to build a fire. And they're taking pictures. And of course they come out and they say, okay, you know, this is illegal. And the long and shot of it is he goes to court. He's in court representing himself. So the fire department presents all these evidence and everything. Mr. Pease looks at the judge. Your Honor, you know, they didn't see that that was a cooking fire that I had. And when they jumped out of the woods, I dropped my cooking rabbit right into the fire and it burnt it up. <laughs> So in that he called it a cooking fire, the judge said, well, just to have no more fires, and he was let go. The town over the years has had um, numerous fires, and I'll go back now to one that all I can do is remember on the Oval, it was the big, the Milford Inn, which sat over on the building over here. And I remember my dad going to that fire, and I remember it was a pretty long, lengthy fire. And at one point, it seemed like the firefighters, the fire was pretty well out, but it seemed like they were never coming out to either go to their vehicles or do anything. Well, it turns out that it seemed like the bar was open. <laughs> and so they, they, they took their time getting, getting out of the building. <laughs> We've had uh, the big white elephant fire, which had many occasions it was, um, it appeared, I should say, it appeared that it was uh, 
not a, something of a, a natural cause of static. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to say it was arsonist. <laughs> Though we did have an arson, we for a long time had these mysterious little sheds behind buildings caught on fire. And it, it, it never made sense because there was no electricity there. Uh, it, just, it just didn't make any sense. Apparently one day, a lady called the fire police chief and said, hey, you come up and I got something strange in my back shed. He went up and sure enough, there was a strange looking setup in the kind of the roof or the uh, sort of the attic space of this building. And that's when we learned really that we did. We had an arsonist in town. And in this case, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to tell you his method of doing it because uh, if all of a sudden like, town and Lowe starts having some mysterious fires, just we'll know who to blame because so they look. You know, we learned that when Pip was telling us a story. Uh, but it was a very clever method of doing it. Um, then we began to try to be on the lookout. Uh, we would try to watch, and have, we made notice to people to watch their properties. And eventually, yes, um, the individual was caught. Uh, and uh, it's, it's one of those incidents and one of those times when, having now been in the fire service, uh, in a professional firefighter, and into being a fire investigator, anytime you have an arsonist, it is extremely difficult to get a court case against them. You've got to have a lot of evidence, but more importantly, you've got to have a law enforcement department that's almost 100% behind you. I was very fortunate to go to Quantico, the FBI uh, school. I spent two weeks down there on arson uh, fires, and um, we had a fire in Manchester. I felt uh, the breast from Milford a little bit, but it's kind of interesting. Um, I get to the scene, the firefighter said uh, there's an individual sitting over there. He's got kind of singed eyebrows and his hair's a little bit singed. I do my general investigation, I look around, and I'm inside, and you can see this line that's kind of going like this. And then you see this one, what in the fire service we call a trailer, meaning that they poured gasoline. Well, this individual, that's what he'd done. He poured some gasoline, and then he poured this trailer, and he goes upstairs. He's figuring that when he gets to the top of the stairs, he's going in his bedroom, bringing this line, of, and he's going to flick his bick, and that's going to be consuming. Only thing that he didn't realize is he gets to the top of the stairs, but he's run out of gas. And he goes into the bedroom, and he keeps flicking his bick, and he comes down the stairs until, <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, um, I'm, I'm talking to him. And it was great because I had just come back taking this course. So he's sitting across from me and I'm talking to him and he's telling me what he did a little bit. And all of a sudden I look at him and I get real close and the techniques that you learn. And I look and I said, I hear what you're telling me. What is the real story? <laughs> and he starts crying. He said, I just want to kill myself. My boyfriend doesn't love me anymore. And, and then the rest of it was all history. And yes, he went to court and he went up to uh, Maine for a little while. <laughs> Let's get back to the volunteer firefighter. I'll talk a little bit about the professional firefighter. He usually has a shift from um, 7 to 5 o'clock or so in the afternoon. He goes in, if there's a fire, he goes to the scene. If the fire carries over into the evening or something, the next shift comes in, they take over, they leave. What about the volunteer firefighter? Now, when that fire comes in, he goes to the fire. He does what is needed to be done. He comes back to the station. And if you've noticed the elevator shaft out here, just imagine coming back from a winter storm and you've got 50-foot uh, lengths of hose that it's wet. <coughs> you've got to hang them to dry. And that usually meant somebody climbed inside that tower I'm inside that shaft on a ladder up to the top, at which point they would lower down a rope, pull one by one, 50 foot lengths of hose up the top, hang it, and make sure that all that hose was hung up. 
Not only that, they made sure that the fire engine and every piece of equipment was in readiness for the next alarm. They didn't just turn it over to somebody else. They didn't have another crew coming in. And one of the areas that I think we miss giving great credit to, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I remember really giving a lot of credit to, and I, didn't, I thought about this when I was uh, trying to put together a little presentation. We never give a lot of credit to the employer, the person who we are working under or working with, and they are so dedicated. I know Mr. Phil Roach used to, you know, he would cringe when he, the fire alarm would for sound. And I, I'm just going to take a second. I had an article um, that he wrote. Now, I, I'll leave it for you to see afterwards. But basically, he said it was kind of difficult sometimes because a customer would come in at 4 o'clock to get their printing job. And I had to tell, tell him, well, our pressman is uh, at the scene of a fire, and it'll be tomorrow morning before you get your product. Many of the employers around this town always were behind their firefighter, always letting them go. The volunteer firefighter may be eating breakfast. He may be at a birthday party. He may be, have worked all day long, go to a fire scene, and what's he do? He goes home to do what? go back to work. We fail to really sometimes realize the true dedication that these people and these men give to the department. <clears throat> you have to be 21 years of age to be able to join Melbourne's Fire Department. So you have to wait until there was an opening, at which point you probably would go and you'd be assigned to one of the companies. <clears throat> and there was always this friendly rivalry between engine companies. I mean, always good humor, good fun. I mean, we poke fun at each other. Well, you, you didn't get that right, and you didn't get this right. Um, incidents that happened. Did any of you remember the Carnelli Farm out on uh, North River Road? And well, it was a winter day, winter night, and I remember the big barn out there was on fire. Most of the engines had left the station, the ladder truck, Truck two, truck three, truck one had not, engine one had not left. I remember Officer Gasper was there, and it was myself, and he says, we're gonna go. Usually you have to have more than just two of you, but we need to get the engine there. So we go to the scene. We get to the scene and they say, we want you to go back to the brook and uh, <clears throat> pump water to the fire. That's called in the fire service a reverse lay. I mean, we're gonna lay from the fire scene to a water source, as opposed to going from the water source to the fire. So off we go, we're taking this line, the line's coming out of the truck, and we're getting there, and all of a sudden we get to the brook. John says, okay, I'll go cut the hole in the ice, you get everything ready, the hot sucks and everything ready. So I'm getting everything ready, and all of a sudden I'm here, chop, chopping away, and then I hear, oh. and I, I look over, and he's standing waist deep in water. He's gotten so excited to cut the hole that that's what he did. <laughs> and uh, that was one of those moments that uh, sometimes you don't talk about it a lot, but it was. We used to have the uh, fireman's ball every uh, January. Um, we would do a canvassing of the town around November which was always a great, fun afternoon for the firefighters. Most of us got home okay after the, after the engines were all put away and we put the money away. Usually would, somebody would invite us to their house or something and well, I'm not gonna say we had anything to drink, but we probably had a lot to drink, so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was really a great time in this town of Milford, the fireman's wall. Growing up, Herb and I, and Herb will vote for this. Uh, one time, I think I said to my dad, I said, Dad, how, how come we have a big long, uh, don't have a big long table? We got this round table. And he looked at both of us and he said, that's because there is no head of the household in our family. We are all encompassed in one. So when my dad was in charge of the fireman's ball, he went out to search for some round tables. And at the time, everybody was like, 
round table, wow, that, never did they go back to the long rectangular table because all of a sudden we found we could talk with each other. I could talk with you and you could talk with me. It wasn't like somebody's at the far end of the, the, the hall. And that's when we could also use the armory. I mean, we used to decorate the armory up and uh, it, was, it was one of those times that it was really exciting. Town of Milford also used to have lots of parades. It's drying you. I don't know whether you know it and remember it or not, but parades on various occasions, um, whether July maybe, Memorial Day, always uh, Labor Day, we had big parades. I remember one year um, the youth fellowship group over at the Congregation of Church, we made a large, I mean large, white cross out of <laughs> tissue paper. And we pulled chicken wire with all this tissue paper. Well, it was in the parade and it was well received. When they, and of course, there was no place to park it or put it anywhere. But the Adams family, the Adams uh, property, well, that's a great place to take it. So down back, they take the, this uh, cross, right across from Sandy's place. It was a place down there. And I don't quite remember which one of us actually encouraged the other to do this. But we did think that it would look quite cool if we put this cross on a raft, which we had down there, and we set it on fire. Now, I will fess to this day that yes, we did that. But at the time, my dad says, oh no, the Adams boys wouldn't do anything like that. But um, it was quite spectacular to see out on the pond, here's this cross. They, I think they thought the Ku Klux Klan had arrived. <laughs> And you know, and, I, and it brings another little story about <laughs> her. Um, it seems that he gets his driver's license and he goes to dad and he says, Hey, dad, can I have the car? I remember my dad saying, Well, I'm going to make a deal with you, her. I want you to bring your grades up in school a little bit. And I'd like you to study the Bible just a little bit more and cut that long hair of yours. So he agreed, and about six months went by, and he goes back and he said, hey, Dad, I think I'm ready to use the car. And I remember my dad saying, I see that you brought your marks up. And I did know that you were studying the Bible. <laughs> what about that long hair? And Herb says, well, Dad, he said, listen, uh, while reading the Bible, I noted and read about all these men, they all had long hair. I remember my dad saying, yeah, but did you know they walked everywhere? <laughs> we just keep, keep organized so that uh, we will love um, them. I remember um, Charlie said to me, oh yeah, I've got to be sure and answer all these questions. Oh, I know the big question that I haven't answered yet, have I? How did Pip get his name? My God-given name is Harold R. Adams. Harold Reuben Adams. Because I've always envied my brother because Roy Rogers was my favorite cowboy, and his middle name is what? Roy. So why couldn't he have Reuben and I had Roy? But anyway, um, I was small. My mom called me a pipsqueak. And um, I don't know, my sister or something said, you know, Mom, you can't call him a pipsqueak. Somehow at that point, and I don't know how old I was, not too old, but um, they rounded off the pip. And believe me, it has stayed that way all my life. Even through the fire service in Manchester, uh, I was always known as pip. To the point that when I finally got on the fire service, I'm on the job about two weeks. I'm up at Engine 10. I go in one night, and my young lieutenant, says to me, um, take the big stick, the big truck, and John, and you've got to go see the fire chief, and he wants to see you right now. Well, don't get me wrong, I was a little bit nervous because I'm like, well, what, what did I do wrong? Get to the station, we park, we go up there, I go in, the chief says, close the door. Now I knew I was in probably some deep doo-doo or something, and he looks at me and he says, don't you ever tell anybody that your name is not Pip. 
because I do not allow nicknames. And so for all my fire career, my name, nobody ever recognized me as anything else but Pip. So that's how Pip became about. Um, while I kind of touch base on Osgood Pond, you do realize that Osgood Pond was also known as Slab City. Yeah. Do you also realize and know that the pond level was controlled by the Burns family because they had fields and when they needed their fields to have water, they would come down and put a splash wood in the dam and that would put the water back to them. They would have to also, Burns family would also have the permission because in, in the mid 50s, probably down into the mid 50s, they cut ice on Osgood Pond. Every, every winter, um, you always see um, on any given Sunday morning or so, you'd see a whole group of men out there and they'd have these drills and they'd be drilling holes in the ice. They would go put a board in the, in the uh, dam because that would force the water up and they would bring that ice up till it gets about 18 inches, maybe 20 inches. And then at some point it would be thick enough and deep enough so that um, they would take this big saw and they would score it and they would make what was called ice floats, which would be maybe 10 or 12 feet wide, maybe 18 feet long. And uh, then they would, they would get those cakes of ice would get brought into a sluice way, taken up to an ice house. And I do have, um, thanks to my brother Herb, this is probably one of the largest ice houses that was in existence in the 50s. But what really nice, we, we, yeah, the okay. Uh, and we always, you know, encouraged dad, but especially got to the third tier, we'd holler, let it go, let it go, because when that block of ice would come out the end, it was so neat, it would go out and, and shatter into a million pieces. <laughs> I also remember very distinctly, um, my dad had a gravy tractor, had one of those plows on the front, and they would use that for finishing getting some of the heavy snow off the uh, ice floats. And uh, one winter, or one time, they dropped the tractor apparently into the water. <laughs> Somehow they were able to get it out. I was old enough so that I could, I was mechanically inclined enough so I could take things apart, put them back together again. So they take the plow off, they bring it up to the house, bring it in the kitchen, sitting right there, here's the big old wooden stove, and here I am with this tractor that's got water in it. So the first thing I did was to take the gas bowl off because it had bubbles in it, meaning it had water in it. And I look around, I'm like, where am I gonna pour it? I'm not gonna pour it in the stove. But there was the big old gray cat's bowl sitting right there. So I poured it into it. And of course it rattled a little bit and the old cat knew that when that dish rattled, that there was milk in there. Well, that old cat came along, it licked up that gas and it ran around and around and the house came back just like that. Did the kid die? No, he was out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, no. um, we did, we did um, do a lot of fun things at, at, at that farmhouse. Um, <laughs> if I can stay in somewhat more here. I'm going to take a couple of moments to do a bit of fire education. Um, Cecile will vote for me that when I did go into, finally go into fire prevention, uh, I, I got caught in a, a real serious backdraft situation. Uh, and um, there was a posting for a fire prevention officer. And she said, you, you, would you like to maybe try to take the test for fire prevention officer? She thought it would be a little, you know, because when I came home, my coat was burned and my helmets melted over my head and she was pretty concerned. And so I took the test and yes, I got on the department. Well, being the new rookie in the fire prevention, the first thing they say to you, you're going to go to school and teach the kids fire safety. Uh, school and kids, I don't have any kids. So I, and the first place they sent me was what? Kindergartens. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not 
too nervous standing up here talking to you, but to go in front of those little kids, I'm telling you, that was a basket case. <laughs> I could not think of what I was going to do. And so over a period of time, um, I guess we became uh, confident and we became to a program that we established. We, they used to say, well, just take the video, push the video in there, and um, you can just sit and they'll, the video will tell the kids. Well, that's not educating kids. Because I think that one of the things that we have to learn, and I wrote an article in 1998, there's a couple of copies up here if anybody wants to take one, called Words Versus Water. We're learning that we need to not put just the wet stuff on the red stuff. It starts with education. It starts with knowing what fire really is. What is fire? Now, I'm so, I know some of you are going to say, well, it's the old fire triangle. And you're probably thinking, oh, okay, we've we got fuel, and that's some heat. And I said, Let's see if I can help make it a little more visible for you, visually. So we have some fuel, and we have our oxygen, and yes, we have our heat. And we have, over the course of time, thought, okay, uh, that's what fire is. But then we've learned that we have this thing called pyrolysis. Oh, that's a big word. The kids used to, the teachers used to kill me because they're like, they wouldn't be in the class when I would be teaching, and they would have to call me at the station. What's this word that you just told the kids? I said, well, it's pyrolysis. It's chemical reaction, meaning all of these elements help with this here. Today we know that it has four sides. We call it the fire tetrahedron. Tetra, which is four, hedron being sides. So we have the fire tetrahedron. Now why is this important to us to understand this? Who, would, who wants to tell me what the three leading causes of fire are? Men, women, and children. <laughs> if you stop and think about it, there isn't one instance that the human invention or in intervention has done something with it. At Christmas time, how many of you put your Christmas tree up and you've got one of those nice little brown, thin extension cords that, oh, it doesn't, oh, I'll plug this into the wall and I'll plug into my Christmas tree. If you have those, do me and yourself a favor. Go home, take a pair of clippers and cut it up and throw it away. Because this is what happens. Now, it may be that you've used it two or three times. Oh, nothing's ever happened. But every time you use it, it breaks down, it gets weaker. And if you understand the formula of electricity, if you have a thinner wire that goes to a heavier wire, where is the greatest heat concentration? Where that thin wire is. And that's when these elements get put together, we have this fire thing called the fire tetrahedron. Now, I also want you to understand fire. It's a small word, isn't it? It is the most powerful tool that we have as an individual. There is no other tool any more powerful. Fire was not invented. It was discovered. But let's look at it. F-I-R-E. Fast. Invisible release of energy. It is that superheated energy that we're concerned with. Now, if I asked you what the biggest part of your body is, what might you say? Anybody want to give me an answer? I know some of you are going to say your skin. Water. It's your lungs. Your lungs is the biggest part of your body. Now, if you don't get good air to your lungs, that means that all these little crazy things called LOVIs and everything, the transfer is over to what? Your heart? Your pumping station? So if that good oxygen doesn't get over to here, where does it not be able to go to? Up here, which is your command center. And so that's why we say you're concerned with this superheated energy. Stay down low. And uh, I always get a little um, concerned because we use these, the old ditty, stop, drop, and roll. But it really should always remember it's stop, drop, cover, and roll. Once again, you're covering your face so to protect your lungs. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of scientific 
uh, background on that, but <clears throat> I'm going to do a little bit of visual. We'll try to do a little visual. Most of us probably say, I know where the fire is. It's, it's, it's right there. I may prove you wrong. Everybody see? Can everybody see right there? Okay, we have a, a cylinder here. We're going to make believe that um, we've got. We're oh, it's in my pocket. Ooh, um, we're we're going to um, use the red ball, meaning fire. So I want you to watch very carefully. Um, how we, we're going to put these in here, you're going to watch it, and let's see if this works out. So, okay, we're going to put green in, then what, the yellow, and then the red. So we saw the fire go in here, right? So we got the fire. <gasps> um, well, I did something wrong. Okay, we'll try it one more time. I'm not colorblind. It does say green, does it? For green, yellow, and red. Ah, we got it this time. I'm sure that it'll come up. <laughs> not really, did it? All right. Sandy, would you come up here? Come on. <laughs> this is not going to hurt you at all. You sure? I'm sure. All I want you to do is hold the fire, show everybody that that's where the fire is. Okay. okay? So, we'll try it one more time. We got green, right? Yes. And we got yellow. Yes. Okay? So they all went in here, right? Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's do something even more for that. How about if you put that red fire right in here? Sure. Yeah, put it right in there. Okay, go sit down. <laughs> so, see, put the fire in here. I know you saw her put it in there, didn't you? Mm -hmm. But I hate to do this. <laughs> so, you may think fire, you know where it's at. But I think I just showed you that it may not be where you think it's at. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody recognize what this might be? You can come up closer and look at it. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. It's one of those barbecue fire lighters or fire starters. And the reason I have kept it because two young children, five and six years old, third floor apartment building. This is what they were playing with. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, they did not perish in the fire, but they did say they had been playing with a lighter. They did fess up to that much. Now, in fire investigation, that's fine if they tell you, but if you don't find the actual article, or if you, and you gotta remember that firefighters, the firemen, or a, I should say, they make fire investigation sometimes very difficult. Because what happens? Their first priority is to do what? Put the wet stuff on the red stuff, get the fire put out, do what we call overhaul, pull the walls down, make sure there's no extinction, extension of the fire, and then they'll say, oh, okay, if you come in and uh, tell us how the fire started. Um, it, it, it's, it's really a challenge, and I, and I have to be honest with you, I loved it. But anyway, they had told me the firefighters are cleaning up and they're shoveling stuff out the window to beat the band. And I'm like, wait, 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 fire. And they said, well, everything's outside. So I think I dug through maybe a ton and a half of material to find this very lighter. And I said to you, what are the leading causes of fire? Men, women, and children. It's a good example of keeping those type of tools in a safe place. So fire, fast and visible release of energy. Um, I can look. <coughs> uh, 
Okay. I'm just checking on time. I was told I had three hours and I got quite a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, we, uh, we know that, it, that another little bit of trivia that I think is very interesting is um, back in the mid 1800s, the steam engine was created. And now we had a vehicle or a means of being able to have more pressure, we could put the water further onto a, a fire seat. Now remember, that fire engine had a fire box, which meant that some person was responsible day and night to make sure there was just enough hot coals in that fire box so that when the alarm sounded and they dropped the traces on the horses and the horses began to hitch the, the engine, that all of a sudden that fireman, fireman, he's shoveling like crazy. How many pictures have you seen of <coughs> old fire engines going to a fire scene and what do you see? The smoke is billowing out because they're getting the coals in there on heating it up so that when they get to the fire scene, there's what? There's pressure for them to be able to um, use. Now, along with that, we know about the Dalmatian. And, and many of us think that the Dalmatian was just a pretty dog that sits on the fire engine. The Dalmatian had a very important process and function in the fire service. Dalmatians and horses are very compatible. The Dalmatian would sleep in the same area where the horses were. When the alarm sounded and they hitched up the horses and off they would go, they would get that going down a main street or something. A street dog would do what? Come out, bark at the horses, scare the horses. But coming from between the whiffle tree and the legs of the horses comes what? That Dalmatian. And he scares the dogs away. When they would tie the horses up at a tree or a place to start using the engine, the Dalmatian was there to do what? Protect the horses. So they had a real function. Along with that fireman, that's how the fireman, not firefighter now, firefighters are putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. This guy was responsible for putting the coal in to be sure you had enough pressure. But then we get, became motorized, we became mechanized, and what happened? The Dalmatian then became that pretty dog that sat up on the fire engine. Um, how many remember old Doc Burns down here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> And Doc Murphy was up over by, uh, where Dyer's drugstore was. I, I, just a quick little story about Doc Burns. I was going to the uh, National uh, Valley Forge Jamboree in 1957, and somehow I had banged my thumb. In fact, is today it's still pretty flat from then. But I banged my thumb, and I was uh, given an opportunity that somebody would help sponsor me if I could raise the same amount of money. So I'm picking strawberries, and I'm like, well. His thumb, being jammed, became almost off, but not totally off. So I had to have a physical old Doc Burns, and he checked me over, and he said, jump in, you're fine. And on the way out, I said, hey, Doc, what do you do for a loose thumbnail? Oh, son, let me look at So I'll be right back, he said. So he comes back, and he's looking at me, and he says, what color is that light up there? The biggest mistake I ever made in my life. <laughs> and, up, and when I looked up at that light, guess what? Mm. <laughs> away went the thumbnail, and away went my blood. Everything. I think I was drunk. I mean, it was like nothing. I went over on. I got over on the old one. I think I sat there for an hour before I could compose myself. And did it hurt? <laughs> yes. I will also mention that I, I was fortunate enough to be with uh, Kyle Norwood Jr at Valley Forge. And when we were putting our tent up in Valley Forge, we were pounding our stake in, and all of a sudden it was like, clink, clink, we discovered a cannonball. And we were so excited with this cannonball, we ran to the fire ranger, or the pack ranger down there, look, we got a And he said, well, go around back and put it out back. We go around back, to this day, I wish I could put it in my pack and brought it home, because there's a mound of fire cannonballs that some of it they've already found. <laughs> uh, so, um, we we didn't talk about Latches Theater. One of the other big fires that we had in town, which turned out to be uh, a, 
uh, a very expensive uh, fire. Uh, OK Tool was when they kind of they got caught up with the environmental thing. But the biggest one was Fletcher Paintworks. Um, we go to a fire there, and pretty we could paint the fire. I think pretty relatively quick, but the building was filled with water. So me and another firefighter, his name's Kenny Hawes, we're in a particular room, and we've got these squeegees, and there's like three or four different drains, and there was these different gut dyes, and we're pushing water, and it's all green. I'm gonna tell you folks, I don't know where this guy was. Even did he in the closet during the fire? But he came screaming at us, green, green, go down that drain. Well, it didn't mean anything to us at the time until after the fire, and we're like, well, what's going on? We looked down the river. Guess what color we saw in the river? Yeah, green. Uh, and then the environmentalists came in, and the rest of it's pretty history. Uh, this reflector's operation became uh, basically not anymore. Um, afterwards, I'll, I'll be glad to try to take some questions. Um, I think I've touched base on most everything I can think of. But like I said in the beginning, I told you that story because maybe I don't remember all and I don't remember as much as uh, I'd like to some days as we get a little bit older and uh, more seasoned. I like to call us seasoned citizens. We're, we're, we're just not old. We're just seasoned. We got, we got good taste. Um, I'm sort of hoping that I haven't bored you here to tears. <coughs> And I'd like to probably close with uh, the fireman's prayer. That would be in, in order with you folks. Uh, so if you'd be with me. When I'm called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me the strength to save some life, whatever the age. Help me embrace a little child before it is too late. Or save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to alert and hear the weakest shout and quickly and efficiently put the fire out. I want to fill my calling and to do and to give my best in me, to guide every possible and every neighbor and protect their property. And if according to your will, I have to lose my life, please bless with your protecting hand, my family, my friends, and wife. And I would just like to add one part to that end of that. And Lord, may you continue to guide, bless, and be with these folks that are helping to preserve those memories, moments, and times gone by here in the town of Milford, New Hampshire. Amen. Amen.